start our recording. So again, very briefly, Diane Michael, Southern States Management Group. It's October 27th. We appreciate you being here for our Build Your Bench and Community Association elections. Thank you for allowing me the time to go over all that. And without further ado, Troy Rails back with Southern States Management Group. I will pass it over to you, Troy. Take it away. Thank you, Diane and uh, Ryan Casey for participating and everyone who is on the uh, outreach program um, Zoom call today. Um, again, um, as Diane mentioned, my name is Troy Railsback, uh, Southern States Management Group, uh, been uh, there for uh, since 2007. So got about 12 years under my belt in uh, the management company itself. It's been around for 30 one now uh, we just passed our 30 year anniversary last year so um we are going to endeavor sharing some of our experiences and um uh, trials and tribulations along the way very briefly as far as um board members and how to get elected to the board and i'll leave all of the technicalities to the right casey folks so I come from a sports background, um, played basketball. So I relate uh, the, the board or the team um, concept when I think of board members and recruiting board members. And I think of, you know, kind of like a, a tryout, if you will. And, uh, and then, you know, if you've never played basketball before or you've never been a board member before, you kind of need to know what the roles are and what your responsibilities are and you basically how to play the game. Um, and the good news is, is we're in a, a small election year this year, and uh, we've all been uh, um, privy to, you know, candidate um, opportunities for candidates to um, cheerlead for themselves, if you will, and uh, quote unquote debate on um, subjects. So um, uh, the, the board um, HOA condo concept isn't com completely parallel to, uh, say, the presidential election. Um, but there's a lot of similarities. Um, there's uh, an opportunity for um, someone to become a candidate. And um, so one of the first things I want to talk about is how do you identify a potential candidate? How do you how do, how do you figure that out? So the statute is pretty clear that you have to do a call for candidates. And in some instances, you have to have open um, uh, a call for a candidate at, at the actual annual meeting. Um, but we're going to just you know, kind of stick with the, the current time um, uh, best practices, which is in the statutes pretty much aligned there, unless the documents are super old, is in advance of a board meeting in accordance with the statute timing, uh, you need to send in first notice that you're having an annual meeting in an election and you call for candidates. And um, they have a candidate information sheet that they should fill out. And uh, you should have one that you've adopted as a board member. The statute gives a pretty good template. And um, um, so you should have that and you should consistently use that every year. And um, so that's what you have to do. You have to send a first notice, you have to call for candidates and you have to give a time frame for them to let you know they wanna run for the board. And um, um, the, uh, the other way to um, endeavor doing this is, is as you, as a manager of an association or as a board member, um, you are going to have conversations each and every day throughout uh, the year that someone may uh, either say, how do I get more involved? Or I wanna change this, or uh, I'm really upset. Um, you, you should, you know, be, you know, in a non-adversarial way, invite them to participate. And that's how you identify potential board members and engage them at, uh, say, a committee level or um, first things is to send them to, um, you know, kind of the website or the meeting notices. Hey, we have meetings once a month. They're there at this time. They're there at this location and invite them to participate as an audience member or a member of the association at the board meeting and build upon that. So one way to, one way to, to, uh, to engage members is to number one, you know, be transparent about when you have meetings, be, you know, invite the membership to um, participate at a, on a committee and 
we found that, you know, uh, whether it's a, an ARC committee member or a fine committee member or someone who regularly attends the meetings, those are members of the associations that um, will, will make really good uh, board members down the road. And so that's, you know, you have them on, on the bench, if you will. And so um, um, we always endeavor from one year to the next or from one term to the next, identify uh, board members who are ready to cycle out or you don't have the time anymore. It's, it's to kind of know that in advance and don't just, don't just identify that you're going to have a vacant seat, um, you know, just because one of the board members is just doesn't turn in their candidate sheet. I think it should be an open dialogue. You can't call for candidates all along the year. You have to do that as part of your meeting and follow the formal balloting process if you do an all call for candidates. So be careful of that. Um, but you should, you know, you should identify um, that, you know, as as a committee opening happens or another volunteer uh, opening happens, identify those individuals who want to participate, who you hope their thought process is, is aligned with the best interest of the association and not necessarily just a personal agenda. And you should cultivate that all along the way. And um, when when you do your call for candidates, hopefully those individuals will turn in their candidate sheets along with anyone else who, who, who does. And as you get to know those candidates, um, they will, um, in, in the battling process goes through, they will hopefully rise to the top and um, get selected to participate as a board member. Um, you know, the, the one of the things that we've done, uh, I've been lucky enough to have a, a very large association of 1900 plus homes and, um, you know, the, they, they have uh, identified a, a point in time between the call of the candidates and um, the, the election um, to do a, what, what they call candidates night. So, in it, and they, they, they put on almost like a town hall and board informative type style meeting. It's not a board meeting. We're not doing a quorum of the board. We're basically setting a night putting in advance, we've incorporated to our annual, meet, our annual meeting notice in our, our election process that if we have more candidates than, than seats available, we're gonna have a candidates night and you're invited and we're gonna let you know about that. It's gonna look a little different this year. I don't think we're gonna be in a room with them speaking live, but we're going to make it happen. We're probably gonna either have a one or two page document that we post on the website on the night we would have the candidates night or maybe even videotape the candidates. So we haven't figured out exactly how we're gonna do it, but that's part of our, over the last eight, nine years, part of our election process. The membership, they, they relish it, they look forward to it. And we time it so that the ballots don't go out until after we have that candidates night. Well, what, what we're trying to do is allow the membership who wants to vote for any of the you know, individuals that will, are going to be on the ballot, to allow them the opportunity to get to know them first. Um, and so we, we want, you know, we want to be able to look back when challenged to say, well, I didn't know any, anything about this person or you didn't give me an opportunity to, you know, let people know who I am. It, it is their responsibility, it's incumbent on them to kind of rally their, their, their fellow membership to, to vote for them. But um, our, the boards, feels it's important to, to make, you know, to give them that platform and um, have that opportunity above and beyond what, what they want to do individually. And then, you know, uh, it, it is a, an opportunity that we, you know, identify to just those who are participating to let them know what the board members are doing and how they're participating. We have regular quorum um, established board meetings and regular schedule. And so we just educate the membership all along the way. So I think, I think um, it, 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 it is very important for the board to identify regular meeting schedules, transparent information, whether it's a newsletter or e-blast and try to do it very consistently and not erratically. So if they miss something, or one thing, they they're totally in the dark. You know, we try to be you know very transparent, have it in, in all on the website and owner portal, um, in some type of uh, a newsletter or, or print that goes out to the membership on a on a regular frequency. And we've timed all those things so they they work around the major inflection points like the annual meeting in the election.
All right, I'm going to talk for one minute here, two minutes here about the kind of the, the, the board member and the election process. And, um, and then I'm going to turn it over to Barbara. So get ready, Barbara. So, you know, we, we, want, we want the membership and the board to be familiar with the process. You know, if, if a board member finds himself on the board because they got appointed because maybe a, a, a previous board member moved out of the neighborhood, you know, we want to educate them. We want to get them involved in the process, have them understand it and be comfortable with it. And along the way, we're going to identify opportunities for the membership to hear that same information. So um, we, we, we would, um, you know, do certain things at meetings and have discussions and, you know, elect officers and do all of those things in an open, transparent format at a duly noticed board meeting and not say, oh, well, we just kind of did this because of this circumstance. No, we're going to notice the meeting in advance and be very fastidious about making what is going to happen and transpire on that at that board meeting on that agenda make to put that out there blast it to everyone post it or however your your meeting notice for um it comes out and make sure everyone's involved in that process that wants to be and then make sure it's reflected in the minutes and and you know we are all constantly in, in the education forums and at our board meetings, trying to make sure it's very clear that the board members are elected to run the business. You know, the, the association is a business. It should, it should operate like a business and they've been elected to do such. And so we wanna make sure the membership understands how that process works. And again, get them engaged if they wanna participate. And um, so if, if, you're doing, if you're doing an election process, you know, I'm just going to talk real quick, you know, so we've sent our both of our notices, we've we've did our call for candidates, we have our ballot out there. And so um, if, if you're a self managed community, or you have uh, um, uh, uh, maybe your, your question how your process is going, make sure it's in accordance with statute, we really in, it would would encourage you to use a dual envelope system with a um, a ballot that doesn't have a name or anything on it. So you have an internal, um, you have a ballot, you have internal um, ballot envelope that just says ballot on it. Now you, then you have an external envelope that is registered with the person's signature, property address, and or, and, and or account number, and make sure that you can verify that. And so you have an outer envelope, an inner envelope, and then the ballot inside of that. And so as you get to your annual meeting and you've turned the, you've collected these ballots nothing should get open in advance of the meeting so i want to you know maybe sometimes there's a there's a misconception that we're the management company or whoever's collecting the ballots or the secretary or something they should start opening them right away that that there's there's exposure there to well who registered which one and and you want to do that all at the annual meeting we've found that it's in the best interest of the association to have a non a uh, candidate um, member of the association who's participating at the board meeting, a group of them, four, five, six of them, open the ballots on behalf of the management company and the board. And so now the membership participates in the process. They're the integrity of, you know, a registered ballot because this is a current owner. They don't have a delinquent balance and you've gone through all those protocols and they're going to separate the outer envelope with the inner ballot envelope. Now you don't know what that in, where that inner envelope ballot came from, but you you keep all of that and you record it, and it's done right there at the meeting. And so I'm I'm going very quickly through some some really tedious stuff that happens at the meeting. But if you have not gone through that process, or you're not going through that process at your meeting, there there the integrity of the of the balloting and the results of the balloting could become an issue down the road. So I want to you know. If, Talk to us, work through Diane. We will we will consult with you wherever we need to do to get everyone an opportunity to understand how it should work. And if we can participate and help you out in any way, we, we obviously like that as well. And then the last thing I would say is if you if you engage an attorney, if you have any questions, um, you know, the statute and the documents are why you do what you do. Um, I always find it's mo my most comfortable when someone asks the association, the board, or myself, why does the association do this? Or why are they doing that? And the best case scenario for the association is to say, because the documents and or the statute say so. 
And if, if you're not doing something or do, doing or something that is in conflict with the statute or your documents aren't obligating you to do it and you're just doing it because you feel pressure to do it or everyone's jumping up and down and screaming and you say, I, we're just doing it to placate the association, that's not a good answer. There's exposure there. So we, we would encourage you to shy away from that and uh, really stick to what the statute obligates you to do and it has defined for you and then what your association documents further um, set up um, that um, are specific to your association. And then, you know, from a membership standpoint, if, you know, uh, you know, I'm not trying to get any board members in trouble, um, but if your association isn't following a statute or, or how the election process is defined, um, statute or documents, um, the, it's, it's incumbent upon the membership to turn it into the state and, and, uh, and, and get it corrected. So with that, I will turn it over to Barbara because she has a great presentation along with Catherine and Aaron. And uh, I'll, I'll look forward to answering any questions um, um, at, in the Q&A section. Thank you, Troy. And uh, thank you, Diane. We are so happy to be here uh, with our friends at Southern States Management Group. And we thank all of you for attending tonight. Um, so uh, before I get started, I do want to introduce uh, my colleagues on the call, uh, attorneys Catherine Miller and Aaron Wallet, who practice in the areas of community association law. You guys want to go ahead and chime in and introduce yourselves. Say hi. <laughs> hi, everybody. <laughs> Hello, happy to be here. All right. So um, in the interest of time, let's uh, let's get moving. Um, bear with me um, while I try to make sure my screen's where it needs to be. OK. Um, hmm. There we go. OK, so we're going to start out with the basics. Um, it's very important to remember that you don't have to conduct conduct an election unless there are more candidates than vacancies. Um, there's no need to put yourself through the hassle and the expense unless you really need to. Um, your governing documents are gonna control the election procedure. Um, however, when they don't, um, we've got the condo statute and the HOA statute. Right, and so this is just a pure math issue, right? If you have five vacancies coming up and four people put in or three people or even five people, you don't have to have an election. If you have the same or fewer number of people put in than vacancies, um, th there's no election. It's just pure math. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, check your bylaws for eligibility requirements. Um, the Nonprofit Corporation Act specifies that uh, candidates have to be natural persons, age 18 or older, meaning they can't be corporations um, or other business entities. Eligibility is determined at, determined at the time um, of the deadline for submitting your notice of intent, if you're in a condo, or on the last day that a member can be nominated, if you're in an HOA. Um, a member is ineligible to serve on the board if he or she is delinquent in a payment of any monetary obligation to the association. Um, this is not, um, it, there's no uh, time period time tied to this. This is um, pure delinquency, right, Catherine? There's no 60 day, no 90 day period um, that like the kind you see with um, suspension of voting rights. Um, a member is also ineligible if they have been convicted of a felony and civil rights have not been restored for at least five years as of the date that they seek election to the board. Um, and something I wanna note here is that in the past, the division has uh, interpreted civil rights to encompass all civil rights. So if you've been a felon and your voting rights have been restored but you still can't own a firearm, Sorry, you are ineligible. Um, so. And that ineligibility, you know, Troy referenced this, is an important thing to, to check before you send out a ballot with people's names on it. So I had that happen to a condo. Um, in fact, it was sitting board members, I think, that maybe reapplied and had some uh, late fees that they hadn't paid. I don't even know if they knew they had the late fees but that they had some, they, they, they had paid untimely their assessments 
and they had some late fees and unpaid and it wasn't checked uh, and ballots got mailed to everyone. They had an election, board members were seated uh, and someone made a complaint and the division of condominium uh, made us go back in time and redo the entire election all over again. And so it was just a big expense. So, you know, the, the ineligibility is serious stuff, even though it was a, you know, $25 late fee, we had to redo the entire election. Now, I've got a situation now with a client where, um, you know, there was an eligibility issue, someone who, a candidate who put in and, and didn't, maybe didn't know um, that there was some amount um, that they were in arrears on in their account. And um, there's some question as to whether the association you know, didn't even make an, an effort, frankly, to notify and say, hey, we, you know, receive your information about your candidacy. We want to let you know that you have maybe this $25 late fee you didn't know about, or hey, you're behind six months in assessments. Did you know that? There, there was just no real attempt to let the candidate know. And instead, it was a, a surprise move, you know, when they announced that they actually really have two eligible candidates because and it just sets up a dynamic where I don't think that's what the intent here is, right? It's not to catch someone and, and, and not allow someone who's interested um, because of a situation with their account that they may or may not know about, which is different though. Sometimes, and, I, and Barbara and Kevin back me up, sometimes we'll have, you'll have maybe disgruntled owners, right? That, that um, maybe they, they were assessed a fine and they disagree with it. So they're not gonna pay it, but they're also now gonna run for the board, you know, to, to, to um, stick it to the man and, and change things, right? And so what one of the things that comes up often in, in um, this slide is that phrase, uh, it's, it's assessment, it's fines, it's fees, or any other monetary obligation to the association. So sometimes it comes up where the association sent someone uh, an enforcement letter, they may have paid the assessment or paid the fine, but they, they weren't gonna pay those, those attorney fees and that falls under that category of other monetary obligation. And, and so, you know, different scenarios, but again, just be careful. And like Catherine said, it's real important to check your eligibility before you send out your ballots, but also important to communicate with those candidates who are showing some interest, make sure that they know if there's an issue with their eligibility so they have an opportunity to cure it. Mm -hmm. All right, if you're in a condo, a member is ineligible to serve on the board if they were previously removed by the division. Um, uh, also, um, ownership is typically required, but the association cannot mandate that you be a permanent resident of the state of Florida in order to serve on the board. In an HOA, a member can nominate himself or herself as a candidate at the meeting. Um, however, the association is not required to allow the nomination at the meeting if their election procedures provide that nominations should be made before the meeting. Also, write-in nominations are not permitted if there is no election taking place. I've got some tiny statutory language down there. Um, but that's, that's the takeaway, right? And nominations are not permitted if no election. Term limits. So uh, this applies to the Condo Act. Um, Catherine and Erin, is there a similar provision in the HOA Act? I deal primarily with condos, but. Not currently. That's okay. Yes, and uh, 2018, the Condo Act was revised to uh, limit board members to eight consecutive years of service. Um, unless um, the unit owners um, approve it, uh, if two thirds of the unit owners approve it, or there are not enough candidates to fill the vacancies. Uh, currently, the division's position on this statute, although that's not uh, like a binding decision of law, um, their position is that this only applies to terms that began on or after July 1st, 2018. There've been, there's been a lot of confusion um, as to whether this applies prospectively or retroactively. Um, and that is the position that the division's uh, taking. As far as I know, there's been no cases decided on this statute. That's right. When it first came out, if you've gone to some of our seminars, you may have heard us say, you know, condo folks, be careful. If you've been on your board for eight years already, or you're nearing eight years, you might want to take a year off because taking a year off will restart your clock. 
Um, but when the change of governors, uh, Governor Scott's appointee in the divisional condominium took a different view than Governor DeSantis's appointee. And so um, right now the current guidance we have, although again, no court ha has issued a, a decision on this, is that so you'll have until 2020, what is that, 2026? Uh, Lawyers don't do math, so don't trust your lawyer with math. But, mm -hmm. um, but, but 2026 is now the deadline if you're a condominium. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Your governing documents are going to provide the specific procedure for your election. Elections are typically held at the annual meeting, um, but uh, your association can vote to, to change that. Um, the Condo Act imposes strict notice requirements, and Troy was, was alluding to those earlier. So in your condo, a first notice of election has to be mailed or delivered to the unit owners 60 days before the election, no less than 60 days. Then, no less than 40 days before the election, interested candidates provide their notice of, of intent to be a candidate. Um, again, if there um, are only enough candidates to fill the positions, if, if candidates don't exceed the vacant seats, no election is necessary. Um, if you do have more candidates than seats, then uh, at least 35 days before the election, the candidates may submit information sheets to be distributed to the owners. And then between 14 to 34 days before the election, the ballot and those information sheets are to be mailed or delivered to the unit owners with a second notice of the election. Uh, the board cannot send any communications which endorse, disapprove, or comment on any candidate. Um, and I want to note here uh, with those candidate information sheets, the association is not liable uh, for what is in that sheet. It's the candidate um, who's liable for the information provided. Yeah, we have clients who who's um, so a couple things about this slide. Uh, first of all, again, this is a, this is a numbers thing. It's a calendar thing. So I have clients that say, "Can you give me an opinion on the dates?" And I said, "You want to pay me three hundred dollars an hour to look at a calendar and calculate backwards from your election?" I can. I'm happy to. Um, but but you know, usually you just start with when your election happens, right? This is going to be the date of your annual meeting. And you're going to just count backwards on your calendar and mark those dates on your calendar. Um, and we get a lot of questions about the candidate information sheet. And you know, someone's used their own form. Someone's put something, you know, vote for me and my two buddies. We're kind of a group running for office. Uh, vote for me because I have X Y Z credentials, and you know, it's not certain if they have them. Just don't edit their document in any way, except that it can be double sided. You can put candidate A on the front and candidate B on the back, but just replicate what they've provided. Um, and the board can't send any communication. So um, it gets really tricky, you know, if the outgoing president says, oh, please, I, I really like such and such, you know, hope they get elected. Um, how do you do that? And certainly would would advise against that. But if, if it's something someone feels compelled to do, they better be doing it in their personal capacity and not sending it out on any uh, formal association emails or using their prez at condo, you know, at gmail.com. I don't want to see that. Proxies are not permitted for board elections. Um, election must be by secret ballot. And in a condo, this is done by using, well, it, this is done by using the double envelope system. Um, Florida law requires that the sign-in sheets, the ballots, voting proxies, all other papers related to elections um, must be kept by the association for at least one year. And I realize now I probably made this confusing by putting proxies in that last paragraph. Um, but again, proxies not permitted for board elections. And in condos. It's super important that retaining all of those records, right, because Correct me if I'm wrong, I think there, a, a challenge to the election can be brought within 60 days after the election. So, mm -hmm. you know, just because it seems like the election went pretty smooth and everybody's happy with the results and, and you think, hey, we don't really have the space for this. And so, it, they, they, you know, all of those records or some of them get, get thrown into the trash. 
And then here you go on day 55, and we've got a challenge. And, and, if, and if that challenge um, goes to the division, you know, they're going to ask for those documents. And, and, you, that, that's, and that's to be proof and, and things of that nature. So um, it, it's important to keep, keep those documents. Mm -hmm. so. Eligibility of voters. Let's talk about that. So check your governing documents for eligibility requirements. Uh, you've probably noticed a theme that you need to check your governing documents whenever you're looking at an election. Um, in general, every unit owner is entitled to vote. Um, that's a right pertinent to your membership in the association. However, an owner is ineligible if voting rights have been suspended for non-payment of a monetary obligation. Um, and that contemplates that the association has followed the proper procedure for suspending voting rights. Um, or the unit owner has delegated his or her partial vote to a uh, joint unit owner uh, by executing a voting certificate. So the ballots must list all eligible candidates in alphabetical order by surname. Uh, it must, they must not indicate incumbents. It cannot contain write-in candidates. There must not have a space uh, or must not be a space for voter signature because again, this is a secret ballot and all ballots must be uniform in color and appearance. The association must provide to the voters two envelopes, one outer envelope that is pre-addressed to uh, the voter um, the envelope is going to contain a place for the name of the voter, unit identification, and the voter's signature. Uh, the association will also provide an inner envelope and, of course, the ballot. Once received by the association, no ballot may be rescinded or changed. Um, as Troy mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, ballots are not to be opened until the election meeting. Electronic voting, I am going to pass this to Catherine right now uh, because she has more, more knowledge on this topic than me. Uh, well, I, I have a number of clients who have asked about it. So, you know, in complete candor, I don't have uh, any clients that I know that are doing electronic voting, but because of coronavirus, and I think that's sort of the, the thing, right? We're all being flexible this year and trying to be electronic where possible. And maybe we're not wanting to, to touch things that, you know, or be gathered in the same space, you know, can, can we do electronic voting? And the two envelope system is required for condos. It's not required for HOAs, but if you're in an HOA and you're a few documents provided, I actually, I love this in, in years where it's okay to gather in person and we have no concerns about the mail, you know, it's a really great trustworthy um, system. And so I've encouraged a number of my HOA clients, uh, if you're permitted to do secret ballots or required to do secret ballots um, to do the double envelope system that's required for condos. Um, if you don't, if you're in an HOA and you don't have uh, a requirement of a secret ballot, you can do a proxy in an HOA, unlike a condo, right? Condos, no proxies. An HOA can have a proxy ballot uh, for voting. Um, and I have had HOAs uh, turn those in in a variety of ways, right? Where if it's not a requirement for a secret ballot for voting, um, could you accept a fax? Could you accept uh, turned in in a different way? And, and my answer has been yes. Um, but there is a specific provision for electronic voting in both condos and HOA statutes. Uh, and it requires an internet-based or online system. Uh, the board has to pass a resolution and the board has to give 14 days notice. So I've had this year, I've had clients say, oh, uh, tomorrow's our board meeting. And I had a couple of board members bring up to me that they'd like to do voting, you know, on email or voting on survey monkey or voting on, and that's not what this is, right? This is something much more formal. And so um, the board would take it up with a resolution and they would give owners 14 days out ahead of time from that board meeting and say, we're going to vote on a resolution to allow electronic voting. Um, and then after that, you're gonna be sending out notices of election. So it's 
probably too late for most of you if you're having an end of the year election. Uh, you're going to be too late for electronic voting for this year. But something to consider if you've been asked about it, you know, I think the board should take it up in the spring or summer of next year. Um, and maybe that's kind of a, a judgment call to see how we're going with this pandemic thing and see what the what the drive is to get. I mean, I think some things are just going to stay. I think some people like more Zoom meetings and, you know, easier when you're traveling around the country or out of the area. Um, maybe people will be more scattered and they'll like electronic voting instead of envelopes or save on the mail. Um, and I, I have a couple of names of companies. There are a couple that have done this for years and years. Um, uh, a couple that are independent from other groups that just do voting, that do it for HOAs and condos, but also do it for other industry associations, bar associations. You know, the Florida Bar, when, it, when we elect our bar president, the 100,000 lawyers of Florida have the option for electronic voting now. Um, so these systems have been around for a while. And I know that, for example, Becker and Poliakoff, the law firm, I think they have uh, in-house proprietary electronic voting. Um, they, they are, I don't know if it's in-house, but related to Becker and Poliakoff that they, that they use. And so for an, after the board elects to offer it, then an owner has to consent to use it. They consent in writing an electronic is good enough in writing, but you have to have some record of the person saying, I, I, I choose it. And if they don't choose it, they still get to, to paper vote. Um, and uh, once they've opted into electronic voting, this is a question I've gotten, do they have to re-opt in every time? Uh, my impression is no, that once they've, if, you, if the board wants to stick with electronic voting from then on out, and the person has opted into electronic voting, um, they can opt out at any time, but they're sort of st stuck in while they're in. And so again, something to consider going forward. We had a lot of questions about it this year and it's um, there's the statute and there's also a Florida administrative code uh, about it. So, but it, it acts the same as the double envelope or the paper ballot. Well, like you said, Catherine, I, I think that a lot of our clients and a lot of the questions we were getting were, were um, obviously not realizing that it's a more formal process. More, most of the questions we, we were getting in fielding compliance was, um, you know, maybe we don't have time for the ballots or, or what have you. And, and just as a, as a convenience or, hey, are we still technically under an emergency? So can we, can everybody just send in their email with their vote? Um, and, and obviously the answer to that is no. And so, um, that, that's, I think, where we were getting a lot of the questions regarding electronic voting, that that's not the statute and the, and the procedure that's provided is, is a more formal procedure and not intended for email voting. Yeah, it's going to be more, I agree completely, it's going to be more formal and it's going to be at least initially more expensive unless everyone opts in and you're saving everyone's uh, mail uh, costs. Um, it's going to be more expensive to, to pay a company to, to do this for you. Thank you guys. I just want to jump in here. Thank you guys so much. We're at 6.15 and we want to keep it mm -hmm. to an hour. And I know we've got a lot of slides left. So just wanted to give you guys a time check. Thanks so much. Yes, thank you. I was actually looking at that myself. Um, I, I put a slide in here for voting machines. Catherine, Aaron, do any of your clients use voting machines? Truthfully, I've never run into an association that does but here you go, it's allowed. And the Florida Administrative Code um, has uh, very specific requirements about it. Um, so as far as conducting the election, again, check your bylaws. Um, in a condo, at least 20% of the eligible voters must cast ballots. In an HOA, a quorum is required. Um, ballots received before the meeting are to be collected and brought to the location of the meeting. Um, again, don't open them before the meeting. Uh, the association uh, should also have additional blank ballots available for those voters who have not yet cast their votes. So this is more uh, about the, the procedure once the meeting starts. Um, first, you collect the ballots that have not yet been cast. Um, next, after all the ballots are gathered, an impartial committee checks the signature and the unit identification 
on the outer envelope against the list of qualifying voters. Um, if an envelope is unsigned, it is disregarded. Um, in the presence of the owners, all of the inner envelopes are removed and placed into a receptacle. Once this begins, the polls are considered closed. No more ballots can be accepted. Then the inner, ballot, the inner envelopes are opened and the ballots are counted. Um, inner envelopes that contain more than one ballot are disregarded. Those ballots are not counted. Um, all ballots and envelopes, including the disregarded ones, must be retained as official records. Um, and with um, the ballots, ballots containing votes for too many candidates um, are disallowed, but a ballot that contains votes for too few candidates are still counted towards um, the individuals that that person voted for. Um, I just thought that would be an interesting note as far as uh, counting your ballots is concerned. So the impartial committee, um, this committee is appointed by the board. The committee cannot include current board members, current officers, board candidates, or spouses of those individuals. Election monitoring by the division is available if it is petitioned for uh, by 15% of the total voting interests or six unit owners, whichever is greater, um, uh, at least 14 days before a planned election and the association bears the cost of election monitoring. I think maybe in you know 10 years of really doing condo HOA law, I've had one client that they there was petitioning for election monitoring. Um, but we do get asked a number of times if we'll come to elections or if attorneys should be mm. there. And there's no real magic. Uh, some of our clients do. Again, it's whether you want to pay us our hourly rate to come sit there at the meeting. You know, we don't have any attorney magic to, to make it go more smoothly. Um, and, and I generally dissuade people. But, it, you know, if you, if you really want us there and there's something we can do or some specific thing you're worried about um, that we can be ready for ahead of time. Um, then I've, then I've gone to some elections. I've been there physically. I think some of the other attorneys at my firm have as well. Yeah. All right, so the election is decided by a plurality of ballots. So whoever gets the most votes wins. Uh, when you've got a tie, the association must conduct a runoff election for those candidates unless the bylaws provide a different method. Um, the runoff election must be held 21 to 30 days after the date of the original election. Notice of the runoff must be given within seven days of the original election. Um, notice will include the date of the runoff and include a ballot and candidate, candidate information sheets previously submitted. And before you go through this process of a runoff election, um, Go back and check your ballots. Make sure that it's actually necessary. Uh, make sure that disregarded ballots were properly ignored. Make sure that um, the, vote, the ballots with too many votes or too few votes were treated properly. Um, and do the math again. Just uh, recount and make sure you got it right. Um, a tie vote cannot be resolved by uh, withdrawal of the excess candidates. Um, a candidate can only withdraw before uh, the original ballots are mailed. Additionally, uh, you can't resolve a tie vote by an agreement between the tied candidates. That, that takes away the uh, membership's right to uh, vote for their directors. And real quick, I mean, sometimes mm -hmm. the from clients is classic vote. You know, there was a tie and so the, the two walked over to the corner and they drew straws and, you know, and it seemed amicable, right? They walked away, they chose, you know, Bill over Sally and Bill and Sally are fine with it. The problem is, right, your membership has just as much um, basis to challenge that. Uh, so again, within that 60 days after the election, if, if you have members who are present and, and who, who don't agree with what, what Bill and Sally did, they would, they would certainly be within their rights to challenge that election. Uh, so, so, you know, pay heed here to the, to the statutes which say the association must hold a, a runoff election. Mm -hmm. 
Um, elections may be challenged. Any challenge to the election must uh, be made within 60 days after the election. That challenge goes to mandatory binding arbitration with the division. Um, and be careful if you are the board that declares ballots or an entire election to be invalid. Um, you've got to be able to demonstrate a legal basis for that determination or you're risking violation of the Condo Act. Um, sometimes after an election, you've still got vacancies. Uh, vacancies may be filled by an affirmative vote of the majority of the remaining directors, even if they don't constitute a quorum. They can also be filled by another election, in which case you've got to follow the regular election procedures. Um, if you fail to fill those vacancies uh, sufficient to establish a quorum, your association um, may be at risk of going into receivership. Um, any member may apply to a circuit court uh, for appointment of a receiver to manage your association's affairs. You want to avoid this. It's extremely expensive. Please, please, please make sure you can find those members who are willing to serve on the board so you can avoid receivership. Right, and, and so combining the last slide and this slide, you can get down to one board member. You can be down to your last board member and they can appoint people up to a quorum and then you're safe from receivership. Mm -hmm. uh, but we wanna make sure that there's a quorum on the board. And I, I, um, I've received a question about uh, well, we don't have, we have a vacancy on the board now. Is that a problem? No, I mean, ideally your board would be full and then you won't have, you know, problems meeting quorum or, but if you're down a person you can go the remainder of the year down a person or two, that's okay. Um, uh, and I also had a question about, you know, does a, does a HOA board have to do the call for candidates? Well, you really should but some HOAs do have elections and nominations from the floor. And so for an HOA, again, you check your specific documents, um, but there may be voting from the floor on the night of the election. And again, so then if you wind up still with vacancies, the new board gets to fill those seats. I think uh, from a practical standpoint, I, I've seen associations who have that vacancy, whether it's in the middle of the year or after the annual meeting, um, correct me if I'm wrong, um, but uh, associations are uh, asking the question, all right, let's just send an e-blast out and see if anyone else wants to run for the board. And so um, <laughs> I was told a while back, you know, if you're going to call for candidates, which is basically what an e-blast is, you need to follow that, that election process to the T. Um, so um, just identifying your, someone on your bench someone who's kind of waiting to step up into a role and just having a duly noticed board meeting and appointing them on motion second, I appoint um, Sally Smith to, to, to fill the vacant seat, um, you know, and then move forward that way. Sending an e-blast or, you know, some type of notice in, in a newsletter or something is a call for candidates and should be avoided um, unless you're gonna go through that formal procedure. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know, if I have a clear opinion on, on whether the e-blast obligates you to have an election, but if you're, you know, trying, if you get a whole list of candidates and the board decides you're going to have a lot of owners complaining that they weren't cho chosen. I, I know that there's some concern like, oh, well, you just picked your, your buddy. Well, we had a vacant seat and, and we, the board is allowed to fill that. So use that easier, less expensive, go, go grab someone, you know, who's friendly and easy to work with and get them on the board. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I'm going to gloss right over this slide and we're going to stay on vacancies. <laughs> um, the last slide was just about certification after a board member is elected, but we're focusing on election process here. So I will move right into this. Uh, the three ways midterm vacancies arrive um, are, or arise are removal, resignation, and recall. Um, removal a director may be removed by the board for certain offenses, uh, the 90 days delinquency in monetary obligations, uh, charges of uh, the specific crimes you see right here, forging ballot envelopes or voting certificates or uh, destruction or refusal to allow inspection or copying of an official record if that's in furtherance of a crime. 
uh, vacancy caused by removal shall be, a fill, shall be filled in accordance with election procedure. Uh, removal may also happen as a result of changed circumstances. Um, if your documents require that uh, board members uh, must be members of the association and uh, a board member sells their unit and is no longer a member, then of course they are no longer eligible to serve on the board. Uh, directors may also resign at any time by delivering written notice to the board, its chairperson or the association. It's effective uh, upon delivery of the notice unless otherwise specified and acceptance of the board is not required. So when you've got vacancies that are not uh, the result of recall, which we will address later, uh, the procedure should be specified in the governing documents. You don't necessarily have to have a membership election to fill that vacancy. Uh, they can be filled by affirmative vote of a majority of the remaining directors, the sole remaining director, or a membership election. Um, let's see. Uh, so um, unless the documents provide otherwise, a board member who is appointed to fill a vacancy uh, fills out or, or serves uh, the remainder of the unexpired term. Uh, a new term does not begin. The eligibility requirements we've discussed previously still apply. Um, a non-recall vacancy may not be filled by a director who was previously recalled during the last election cycle. So they're not gonna sneak back on the board this way. And I'm just gonna jump right in really quick. I know that we are coming mm -hmm. right up at the end, but I know that we have some amazing slides left. So just hang in there with us, you guys. Just a lot of great content and, and, and we're getting through it as fast as possible. Mm -hmm. So thank you for staying with us. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, recall, here are the, um, there's statutes and administrative code that govern recall. Um, let's see, uh, board members may be recalled by a majority of the voting interests at any time with or without cause. There are two ways to do this. You can do it by written agreement, which is the division's recommended approach, or by a special meeting. Um, it's much harder to satisfy the requirements associated with a special meeting than it is to uh, comply with the written agreement procedures. So uh, that's why the division recommends it. Uh, substantial compliance is required. Consult counsel to ensure compliance with a recall. Uh, with a, a recall by written agreement, basically you, you get a collection of ballots from owners um, voting on whether, on to, on whether to uh, recall the current board members. Um, you serve that agreement on the board. Um, and I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I've used written agreement and ballots interchangeably here, but a written agreement basically means the collection of ballots. Then the board holds a special meeting to certify or reject that recall effort within five business days of receiving that agreement. Uh, by special meeting, um, regardless of what your documents say, a uh, special meeting can be called for a recall by 10% or more of the voting interests. The owners uh, start this by signing a signature list. They uh, deliver this signature list and notice of the special meeting uh, to all owners and to the board. The board is then obligated uh, to conduct, a, well, a special meeting is then conducted. Um, if the members vote in favor of the recall, the board then has to notice and conduct a special meeting within five days after the recall meeting. At that board meeting, the board votes whether to approve or um, the term we use is certify the recall or they vote to dispute it. If the recall is certified, the recalled member or members are removed from office and they must turn in all association records or other uh, documents in their possession uh, within 10 days of the vote to recall. Uh, so that would be within five days after the board meeting. If recall is disputed, the board files a petition for arbitration and uh, that petition must be received, not just mailed, no later than five days after that board meeting is adjourned. So there's a very narrow window for you to get that petition sent to the division. Um, if the recall is certified, then um, 
the recalled board member may file a petition to challenge the recall within 60 days after the vote. Um, if the board fails to hold the meeting or if the recall is rejected, then the unit owner representative who uh, spearheaded the recall can file a petition for arbitration. And that petition must be filed within 60 days after the expiration of that five day period following the recall vote. Um, let's see, uh, keep in mind that the division is not going to accept a recall pe petition when there are 60 or fewer days until the scheduled reelection of a member that's being recalled or when fewer than 60 days have elapsed since that person's election. Okay, so we're in the era of COVID-19. We're social distancing. We're conducting virtual elections. We're using electronic voting. Um, I know this is a, a hot topic for a lot of associations. Um, and I'm gonna call on Catherine and Aaron now um, to offer their thoughts about, you know, how, how do you conduct an effective election um, during this pandemic? We've talked about some ways um, what are your clients doing? What are you seeing? Well, I think as we talked about, I mean, I'm not seeing um, any of my clients um, undertaking the formal uh, electronic voting procedures, um, but the many of my clients are um, getting organized maybe a little bit earlier than they would have in, in other years um, past because um, there is a, maybe a concerted effort to um, encourage owners to, uh, to, to vote, by, um, vote by ballot. Uh, there's also a lot of efforts being taken to where in years past, right, there, there wouldn't have been efforts to make the annual meeting um, visible through like a Zoom call like we're doing now or, um, you know, through a conference call. Uh, making those options available. So of course, you're, you know, to the extent that you can, if you can have your meeting outdoors, you have that ability, um, certainly social distance. Um, you know, you want to be able to try to the, to the extent that you can to, to still hold a physical annual meeting. You know, you have that obligation on your documents. Your documents say that it has to be on the third Saturday of, of December, then, then, you know, that's when you have to have it. Um, and if, if you have some flexibility in your documents, try to use that flexibility and, and hold off, you know, in the hope that, that obviously the, the uh, cases go down and things improve. Uh, so maybe it will be a little bit safer, let's, let's say in January or February. So if your documents allow you to hold your meeting anytime within the first quarter of the calendar year, great. Let's, let's hold off and, and wait until the end of February and, and just push it back as, as, as long as we can. But I'm, I'm highly encouraging my clients to start taking efforts now to, to make available every possible option for their owners to attend remotely. Um, so Catherine, do you have anything in addition to that? No, I, I think I would agree with that. And just, you know, what we're all experiencing, whether it's in our families or our HOAs or our workplaces, or everyone has a different level of comfort. So some people are not leaving their house, end of story. You know, they'll send you an a envelope back and maybe they'll zoom in, but they're not leaving. Other people are out and about and uh, with a mask or without a mask. And so you got to kind of figure out what, what is the safe thing. Obviously, you know, social distancing and masking is um, a generally accepted safe way to proceed. And that's how we would encourage it. And that's the sort of the outdoor or the, I have people who traditionally would kind of rent a small room and maybe now they're renting a large space or trying to find a large space mm -hmm. so they can spread out um, or to shorten the meeting. So no, no one's inside for a particularly long amount of time. So, you know, we're just trying to make it work and, and it's a really new era. We, we have not experienced anything like this before. Um, and I just think it's really important to be accessible. And I think I'm seeing a slightly lowered interest in new board members this year. And I don't know if that's Troy's experience, but um, you know, associations not having elections or not having the interest to fill the seats. And so we're fielding, fielding some of those questions of, we only had one person put in for next year's board or two people put in for next year's board. 
Um, and just to remember that the work of the association, y'all know it, is still going on. And so to recruit people and to tell them it's not some onerous thing to be on, on your association's board, but, but really a privilege to get to, to work and make the community better. And, and, and just I'll jump to make that easy. I'll jump in real quick. What we've seen, we had a couple elections happen over the summer. Um, one of the associations, because everything was so new, they actually sought a, a position statement or resolution, uh, I think is how they um, uh, put it in play. And they sent that out with the notice on how they were going to conduct the election. And it actually involved um, uh, the ballots being opened by management. And uh, so the Zoom thing was just happening starting and they um you know people were allowed to kind of zoom in and and watch it and so we've seen a a, a very different hybrid not different but a, a hybrid of that where um, we're trying to or as you said organize early and they're either doing it outside of their pool or out in a much larger room that they ever had intended and then giving people uh or originally used and then giving people the option to participate um, remotely and just putting a camera on letting you know those who are there um, trying to, you know, identify volunteers that will open the open the ballots and, and just let everyone watch it. And so, you know, if it's ever challenged down the road, number one, the resolution, the thought process of that council was, we told you in advance how we we're going to do this. Um, it's new to everyone, and you know, we're going to back it. And and so that's that was one of the the trends that we we see. But I think the blend of those who want to come, come. Those who want to participate remotely have that option available, and then no one will feel disenfranchised. Just be real careful. I mean, this week I've had a few associations contact me and and, um, and say, well, it's an, it's an emergency, right? COVID, we, we're just not going to have an annual meeting. It's, it's not safe. And isn't there more, you know, and they started kind of going down that road, and, and, and I had to really caution them and say, you know, your documents, one, I would caution to say, I, I don't, you know, I don't, we're not under a declared state of emergency now, certainly in the same respect that we were right in, in March and, and in April and, and things. So things have opened up, you know, certainly Florida in particular, you know, um, so with that in mind, I, I, I would, I think there's more, frankly, a little bit more liability potentially from claims from owners if you just say, we're just not going to have, we're just not going to have an annual meeting. Uh, the business of the association has to go on. Your documents say you shall have an annual meeting. Your owners are entitled to, to obviously attend and, and get financial information and operations information. So just just trying to sort of rely upon COVID as a reason why we're not going to have a meeting this year, even if you're not having an election, right? You take the election out of it, but, but hey, we're not having elections. We don't have a lot to report. We'll just email everybody the budget and, and we'll call it 2020. I think that's dangerous. And, and so there are options where you can have the meeting, keep everybody safe, allow participation. And I think the association really has to explore those. And one more real quick point. We're seeing a lot of associations send their first notice with a to be determined um, location and or um, electronic format and then formalizing that in the second notice. Right or wrong, um, you know, it's sticking and we're, you, we're just keeping them informed along the way because 60 days plus out. Um, you know, state of emergency, whether it's on or off, could change um, it, within that time frame. Yes, yeah, so, I mean certainly the num the num the COVID numbers change all the time, right? So so I was doing more, and now I'm like oh, I don't know if I want to go to all those places. J just personal preference, and so you you know your homeowners are doing that. Um, same thing, and so I, I I don't mind. My suggestion would be to list a location and say something like subject to change, or we'll also send out online information the more you can nail down the better but certainly give yourself some tbd wiggle room about you know it may change and your venue may change your venue may not allow you to to bring 50 people into the building anymore um we did receive a question about whether uh, someone zooming in could count towards quorum to hold the meeting uh you're gonna hate this answer i think it's gonna depend on your documents Right, and um, if your documents say something about in person or um, present, I have some concerns about that. But you know, you could do a proxy for to get the t attendance, have them mail in a proxy piece of paper, and let anyone zoom um, if that were a concern. Or depending on what your individual documents say, maybe the zoom is good enough. I, I think it's going to be a, a individual specific assessment 
for each association as to whether you could count someone zooming in as attending, but I don't think you can really vote by Zoom. Uh, there we go. So we're at Q and A. We've answered some cues. Um, I will. I'll. Uh, do you want me to stop sharing my screen, Diane? I would love I know we are. To, I would love for you to put up the last screen so everyone can oh, see yes. contact information. There we go. Uh, Brooks was not here tonight, but he's on our slide. <laughs> So this is where you can contact us. Feel free to email us, reach out, give us a call. Um, we'd be happy to talk to you about your association's concerns. Thank you so much for being here tonight. We, have, we do have one that just came in to follow up on that question. We have sent in proxies to establish a quorum. What happens though, if we do not get a quorum in these proxies? So I'm assuming this is a HOA and an HOA that doesn't get quorum technically doesn't have the business of the annual meeting, which would include the election, right? So I've had associations um, try and try and try and not be able to get quorum. So they, they technically don't have a meeting. They don't have an election. Uh, and again, it's going to depend on your individual documents, what they say. But usually if there's no election, the old board continues to serve. Um, a number of them will probably resign or drop off because if they didn't sign up to come back. Um, but but so, you know, I encourage people to work hard to make a quorum. So whether, uh, you know, you need to make a few phone calls or follow up with people or send out some email blasts, you know, please, please, please send back your proxies so we, we can get a quorum. And some people do proxies without any other business other than to get a quorum. Um, so I have seen a number of those proxies only for the purposes of quorum. And sometimes there's something else to vote on too, but I would really push the, the proxies. And if that looks like it's not gonna work, check your specific documents to see. Um, but generally, you know, you don't have a quorum, you don't have the business part of the meeting. I also just got a recommendation from a board member to uh, let you know that if you're having an outside meeting, outside of a building to ensure the irrigation system is off. And I think that's a good, I think a good suggestion. So thank you for that. One more question that just came in, can proxies be emailed? Depends on if you're a condo or HOA. So, um, and I have had, well, you know, maybe it doesn't. I have had, a, I know I've written them for HOAs uh, where they, they have been accepted via email. So, you know, you could, you're allowed to return them in whatever format, right? The proxy is not secret. There's nothing secret about a proxy. So I have had some say you can fax them back. You can email back to this address. And maybe that would be the same for a condo proxy. But again, you can't use a proxy to do an election in a condo. Mm -hmm. So to, to get a quorum, you, you could. You could say, email me back the proxy form. I think the statute just says it has to be received by the by the by the association prior to the starting meeting. meeting. I'm not sure that it gives real specific details on how it, how it's received. But again, a proxy is not um, you know people think of maybe less formal you know, oh, I give Sally my proxy, she can vote for me. That's not what a condo or HOA proxy is. It's a very specific form. Um, that you've filled out, you've checked what it's good for, you've signed it uh, as, as the voting representative of your home or your unit. Um, so there is a, there's a form that has to be used. Um, so you can't just email in, hey, count me there for the meeting or I give my proxy to Susie. That's not good enough in the condo HOA context. But I think, I think you could, if the board made the decision to accept paper proxies, you know, scanned in and emailed, absolutely. Troy, you see any problem? Is Troy still there? Do you see any problem with that? Yeah, no, um, it's, again, it's an advanced uh, procedural, as long as it's not in conflict with the documents or the statute, um, you know, it's just the association, uh, we're always an advocate of, you know, be proactive, get the stuff, get the, you know, you know channel the opportunity for them to participate and make it as easy as possible and, uh, and make it available to everyone. And, you know, I, I think at the end of the day, 
it's you, you can't be you know as long as you're not in conflict with statute of the documents i don't think you can be um, criticized or there's exposure there and i got a question about the statute speaking to the election process and i think uh, one of the first or second slides um barbara you had that up there so that was one of the questions that i got earlier so that was the only thing that i had that was uh um open from a question okay. standpoint. Well, I had a question earlier about how does the board check for felonies? Do we just need to update our forms? And it's really, I guess, for just Aaron and Catherine to help with that. Do we just want us to update our forms and just say by signing this, you know, your your signature lets us know that you're 18 and older and that you have, haven't committed a felony? Would that work? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, I, I think if, if you do that, your form like that and um, have your candidates basically attest to yes. that, um, you know, and, and uh, you know, short of running criminal checks on, on everyone, which is, is not a great idea. Um, right. I tend to think that that is, is, is a good way to, to go about it. Okay. It Thanks. usually there's some level of suspicion that the only times it's come up have been like, well, we think so and so has a criminal record or we're concerned about such and we checked, you know, I've never had it just done for every candidate, but, but I do strongly recommend checking to see that every can you know, get with your treasurer, get with the management company and say, is, is everyone caught up on their payments? Does anyone owe money? Yeah. Put them on a ballot. Cause that's more to, to my mind, that's more likely to occur than someone um, with a felony. But I, you know, let let people know that they can't that they're not eligible. Like let let people know the baseline for eligibility and okay, whether your state has any. We get the question all the time about well, they don't actually live here. You know, it's someone's daughter, or it's it's someone's son, or it's someone. And um, you know, don't they have to be an owner? Not not in every association. So. You, know, you do want to make sure the board and the applicants are familiar with the uh, eligibility requirements. I have two more questions that have come in and for anyone that wants to pop off, we so thank you for allowing us to go over. We only were a few over um, and we thank you for that. And um, attorneys, if you're okay with just taking two more, mm -hmm. we'd appreciate it so much. Um, the first one is, yeah. can a non-owner who resides in HOA home be eligible to be on the board? Probably. I, I, it depends on what your documents say. Okay. I mean, if there's no, um, my understanding is if there's no requirement um, that you be a member to serve on the board in your documents, then that, that person could. Um, so yeah, there's, the there's no statutory there's it, yeah. by statute it's not required in either condo or hoa most hoa governing documents say be an owner uh most hoa documents do not say that but if you do um or have some other eligibility you know so, some hoas it's com the board is comprised of representatives from sub associations or something so again you want to kind of look at how, how you're um, comprised and the reasoning is especially for smaller HOAs you know you may want to get someone with a specialized area of expertise you may want to have you know an accountant on the on the board or someone from down the street or a lawyer on the board or something you know it may be hard just to get five people on the board if you got an HOA of 20 you know with, with Troy's almost 2,000 member HOA you know they probably have less of a hard time filling seats um, yeah, so that so reference documents is is best. Yes, yes. Um, when do, and then the next question that came in is when nominations are taken from the floor, no previous disclosure checking for eligibility can occur. What do you suggest? And that'll be our final question. Yeah. <laughs> mm. That's the danger with with uh, 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 you know. Um, on the floor, anytime I see those in documents, I just cringe. I, I think, oh, uh, nominations from the floor are wrought with with potential issues uh, in in all manner, right? How it's going to be handled um, and, and whether they're eligible. So uh, I don't have a straightforward answer for you because I, I just think that that process um, creates far more, more problems than it, than it solves. Um, 
Um, but there would be it would be hard, right? I mean, you have to have your secretary there with with your, you know your owner role, so to speak. You know, just to be ready for it, and maybe be, I don't think you'd obviously be able to check um, for felonies and, and those types of things, and whether someone has been subpoenaed. Yeah, I'm sorry, suspended by the division. Those types of things. But at least you would be able to check real quick, um, you know, if someone is current in in their obligations to the association, and you'd have to you'd have to check the other things after. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you to Troy Railsback with Southern States Management Group and all of you wonderful educated attorneys at Wright and Casey. All of their contact information is up there, but as always, you can find more information about them at surfcoastlaw.com, which I think is so cool. Our presentations are always available on the Southern States Management Group's YouTube channel. Um, we also have some great resources on our website and under the news tab, you can find this presentation and you can share it with other board members who may not have been able to attend, but really we encourage you to have your board members attend these live so that they hear the information for themselves. Um, watching a video is great, but the interaction is very important. And because of the times, we appreciate your time in, in listening and, and being a part of it. Um, and there was some appreciation from some members. And so thank you to everyone for attending and for going over a little bit. We hope that everyone has a great night, unless Troy or any of uh, the ladies have anything to add. Thank you to everyone. I really, really appreciate everyone participating and listening. And uh, Ryan Casey, as always, we appreciate you partnering in our education series. Thank you. <laughs> everyone night, have everybody. a good evening. <laughs>